Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. I'm Jeremy Pearsons. It's my joy and honor to be with you again all this week. Thank you to my grandparents, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland, for allowing me this opportunity to come into your life, your home, uh, your office, wherever it is you're watching this right now. I'm just thrilled you've got it turned on. You know, when you, when you set your heart and your mind, your affection and attention on the things of God, he said, when you honor him, he'll honor you. And you are doing that right now because you could be doing anything with this time. You could be watching something else. You could be listening to something else. But what you are doing is prioritizing God and his word. And when you honor him like that, it's like opening up a door wide for him to just flood through it in your life. So that's what I'm excited about this week. I got to spend all last week with you as well. So if you missed any of that, let me encourage you to get caught up with us. Uh, any of those broadcasts can be viewed for free at KC org or on KCM's Roku channel. This whole broadcast, this entire ministry is about one thing, getting the word of God into your life. And I'll remind you of something we said last week. You know, Jesus said it. Anybody who comes to him and hears what he says and then becomes a doer of what he says he said that one is like building a foundation underneath his feet. It's like building a house on a firm foundation, but it requires all three of those things. Coming to Jesus is good and it's first and every one of us have to do that. Hearing his word comes next and that's good and that's what you're doing right now. But even then, we're not finished. What's last? You have to become a doer of the word that you've heard. And when you become a doer of that word, it puts firm foundation beneath your feet and you can build your house, you can build your life upon that rock. So I believe the Lord's gonna minister some good things to us all this week, today on this broadcast and for the, the rest of this week, I want you to um, open up your heart wide. Open up your eyes and your ears and let the Lord say something to you. And we may look at scriptures that, yeah, maybe you've heard them before, but this thing is alive, man. I mean, there's, there is no end to the revelation that we can get out of verses that maybe you've looked at hundreds, even thousands of times before. That proves to us it's living. That proves to us it's alive. And if it gets in you, it'll make you alive. Amen. So let's pray together today and we'll get right into the word. Father. You are so good to us. We love you and worship you today. We come before your word with eyes and ears and hearts that are wide open. We want to see Jesus, hear his voice, and understand more about who we are in him and who he is in us. And Lord, you have begun something good in us and we call you faithful to finish it because you are the author and the finisher of our faith. We love you and we thank you. We give you all the praise in Jesus name. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bible with you today, I want you to go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 13. We began last week asking this question, and it's a question I've heard myself ask. It's one I'm pretty sure you've probably asked as well. Any, any believer has faced this at, at any given time in their walk with the Lord where they might look at what's going on in their lives and for some reason it just doesn't seem to be matching up with the expectation that the Word of God will build. And it's a good expectation. As a matter of fact, that's what Bible hope is. It's expectation. And that's why the Bible says a man doesn't hope for what he sees. If he sees it, why would he be hoping for it? It has to do, hope has to do with the unseen, what you're expecting in the future. But every one of us have found ourselves in the place where, man, I'm expecting something good. I may not be seeing it right now, but I'm expecting it. But that space in between what you are experiencing at the moment and what you are expecting to see in the future is a particularly important space. And it's a space where Satan does his best to get you to lose your faith, to get you to turn back and walk away from the Lord, to get you to throw in the towel. And like the psalmist said, I would have. I would have quit a long time ago. I would have lost heart. I would have fainted if I hadn't believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And like we've said before, many people are in that same place. I'm about to be done. I'm about to quit. I'm out of here. But their criteria for hanging in there is I better see something change. They're saying I'm quitting this marriage if I don't see change in my spouse. I'm quitting this job if I don't see promotion on this job. But we're not that way. We're not supposed to be that way. 
What is it that is supposed to sustain us in that space between what we're experiencing and what we're expecting? It's not seeing the change, it's believing to see the change. It's your faith and being a keeper of the faith that will sustain you through any challenge, through any trial. And the Bible says it's the strong spirit of a man that sustains him in bodily harm or in pain or in trouble. So we were asking and answering from the Word of God this question, when it looks like it's not working, why, Lord? Is, is there something going on that's keeping this from working in my life? And we spent a long time looking at that last week. I don't want to take the time to cover all of that again. So again, let me encourage you to go back and get caught up. All of those broadcasts are available to you for free. We'll put a link here uh, at the bottom of the screen. I want to make sure you know how to go get the word. It's available to you 24 seven and there's no excuse for you and I to, to miss it, to not hear it. But I want to go on with it today. And if you've got your Bible, go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 13. And in Matthew chapter 13, you see what we call the parable of the sower. You might call it the parable of the seed. You could also call it the parable of the ground, because really that's what this entire parable is about. And you see it here in Matthew 13. You see it in Mark chapter 4. You also see it in Luke chapter 8. And we're going to dig into it together because of something Jesus said about it. When his disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to these people in parables? I believe it's in Mark's account of this where he said, look, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand any of them? In other words, I believe there are some master keys in this parable, this parable of the sower, the seed, the ground. There are some things that if you will understand this, it will unlock a lot of other things to you. And that's what a master key does, doesn't it? It's one key that unlocks many doors. And that's what I believe we're seeing in this parable. That's how important it is. That's how paramount it is. And if it's that important and Jesus said it was that important, we should take some time with it, right? I mean, we should endeavor to understand these things. And again, maybe you've heard it before. Uh, I know growing up in, in the Copeland Pearson's house, um, Papa preached a series on uh, the sower sows the word. And that series is still in inventory here, I believe, at KCM. I think they maybe changed the name of it. But when I go back to it as a kid, I remember those tapes. It was a, a, a plastic uh, set of tapes. You opened the binder and I think there was four or five tapes in there. And I'm just telling you, this is a classic one to me, to my family, and to this ministry. This was something that was one of those fundamental teachings. But even if it's something you're familiar with and has been around in your life for a long time, again, let me challenge you, go back to those things that you think you know. Go back to those things that you think you've got. Because it's when you slide into that place of complacency, thinking, oh yeah, I've heard that before. Oh yeah, I know that. Is there something else? I'll be watchful right there. Because the moment you think you've got it, you've just cut off yourself from receiving any more revelation from it. So let's be hungry to look at these things again and maybe look at them in a way we never have before. Matthew chapter 13 says in verse one, on the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea and a great multitude were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spoke many things to them in parables saying, behold, a sower went out to sow. Why? Because that's what sowers do. A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, listen to these words, some seed, some seed, that's important. Some seed fell by the wayside. The birds came and devoured them. Notice verse five, some, you see that same word again, some seed fell among stony, place, stony places where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root. They withered away, verse seven, and some fell among thorns and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, every time Jesus said some seed fell here, some seed fell there, some seed fell on this ground and some seed fell on that ground. It's important to note that when he said some seed, it was some of the same kind of seed. In other words, it wasn't 
a particular kind of seed fell here and another kind of seed fell there. Now it's important to note that when that sower went out to sow, he has strapped around him, if you will, a big bag of seed and it's all the same seed. And he reaches into that seed and he scatters it. He throws it. And as he's throwing that seed out, get this picture, some of that seed is falling on this kind of ground. Some of that same kind of seeds falling over here and some seed fell on this ground. And then finally some seed fell on good ground. Now, the reason I bring this up in the context of us asking, why isn't this working? Is because what you see here is the same seed getting sown four times. But go back and look at it and ask yourself this, how many times did it work? How many times did it produce? Well, you know, when it fell on the wayside ground, it didn't produce anything. That wayside ground is just hard packed uh, earth. It would be basically the first century equivalent of concrete. I mean, wayside is where the animals and the people would walk and that ground would get so hard that when that seed fell on it, it couldn't penetrate soft earth. It just laid right out there on the top and the birds came and devoured it. So when the seed fell on that ground, did it produce? Or you could say it like this, did it work? No, didn't work, didn't produce anything. Then it fell on stony ground. Now that may make you think of ground that's got rocks out on top, but that's not actually what it's a reference to. If you study it out, you see this through the rest of the parable, he's talking about a shallow layer of earth where the seed gets in, but underneath that shallow layer of earth is solid rock. So even though the seed got in, it couldn't go deep. It had no depth, Jesus said. And he said it sprang up, but the sun scorched it and it was fruitless. It didn't produce anything. So there's the second kind of ground that some of that same seed fell on. And you could be asking, well, did it work? No. And then it fell among thorns. Here's a third kind of ground. And that seed got in and it sprang up, but the thorns also sprang up around it and it choked it out and it became unfruitful. So there again, you could ask, did the seed work? Did it produce anything? Did it bear fruit? And the answer is no. Now, if you were to stop right there, after this seed was sown three different times on three different kinds of grounds, you might be tempted to think something's wrong with this seed. It's not producing anything. It's not working. It's not working. I sowed it and it's not working. Something's wrong with this seed. And you might be tempted to think that there's a problem or a fault with the seed until you get to good ground. And the moment this seed, some of the same kind of seed that was sown here, here, and here, the moment it gets sown on good ground and it produces something, it bears fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold, that's the moment you know nothing wrong with this seed. It's not the seed's fault because here it's working. So again, we're asking this question, why isn't this working? And there are people asking it. Maybe you're asking it right now. Why doesn't it seem like this is working in my life? Well, you have to come back to the word because tradition and religion and just plain ignorance, people have tried to answer that question so many different ways, a myriad of different ways, and they don't seem to come up with the right answer. Somebody says, well, why isn't this working? And somebody will say, well, I don't know. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. That's not a good answer. It's an answer, but it's not a right one. Somebody else might say, well, you know, listen, this works for some people, but it doesn't work for others. That's not the truth. And it's not a good answer. You want to know the answer I hear most often for the reason why it's not working? It being the word. And you'll see that in just a moment. People like to say, well, the sovereignty of God the sovereignty of God. God in his sovereignty chose for it to produce here, but God in his sovereignty chose for it not to produce here. Wrong, eh, not the truth. These are not good answers. But if you wanna know, and if you're willing to be honest before the Lord and let his word be honest with you, out of the mouth of Jesus, he's about to tell you why it's not working. But here's where you have to start. You have to start with this belief right here. Nothing wrong with the seed. There's nothing wrong with this seed. You have to start right there. Now, Jesus goes on and the, the scripture goes on here in verse 10. 
It says, the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries. It's been given to you to do what? To know the mysteries. In other words, it's been given to you to know some things that not everybody knows. These things are mysteries to many people, but it's been given to you to know it. Now you see this here in a second, but think about what does it mean to know a mystery? If you know a mystery where something remains mysterious to other people, that simply means you understand something that somebody else doesn't. Or maybe you understand something that most people don't. You'll see that's what he's saying. To you, it's been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it's not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given and he will have abundance. Now we talked about abundance all last week that Jesus said, I came that you'd have life and have it how? More abundantly. You see some of these same things coming here. Him, to him who has more will be given, he'll have in abundance to the full till it overflows, excess. He said, but he, whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from them or taken away from him. Now, man, if you just take that verse out of its place and you just tr try to think about that, it's like, man, well, Lord, that just doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right or just that somebody who has something, he'll have more, but somebody who doesn't have something, even what he has will be taken from him. But put it back in the context and you'll understand what he's saying. He's saying to you, it's been given to know the mysteries. In other words, you have, here's a key word, understanding. You have an understanding. And he says to him who has, has what? That understanding. Or you could say it like this. You have revelation knowledge. You look into the word of God and it's not a dry, dead letter to you. It's living to you. Now, let me just stop right here and make sure that you and I both understand what a privilege and what an honor that is. Do you know how many people today and for hundreds of years leading up to today have looked into the word of God and gotten nothing out of it? They've looked and to them it's just old and outdated and confusing and written in a weird Elizabethan <laughs> language and it makes no sense to them and they give it a shot and they get done and say, well, I don't know what it, that was about. And they walk away from it. And what a privilege though, on the other hand, and what an honor it is for you and I to be able to open up the word of God and read it and understand now, maybe that doesn't mean you get it all mentally. That's not what I'm talking about. When I talk about understanding, I'm talking about what Paul wrote to uh, the church, uh, the Colossians. He said, uh, well, let's just look at it. I, I don't want to get it wrong. Colossians chapter one. He said in verse nine, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask. Here's our prayer for you, that you'd be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom. Now, listen to this and spiritual understanding. This is what Paul was praying for this church. And you know that if it's in the word, this is a spirit led, spirit inspired prayer. In other words, this is a prayer God wants to answer. So you can pray this for yourself. We can pray it for each other. As a matter of fact, let me just do it for you not right now. Father, I pray over everybody watching this broadcast right now that they would be filled with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now I'm praying that for you today. Would you pray that for me? Can we pray that for each other? We know since it's in the word, God will hear this prayer and answer this prayer that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will. How wonderful would that be to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God for your life? If you are filled with something, how much room is there in you for anything else? None, because you're filled with it. That means every space and every place in you is already taken and, and you are filled with the knowledge of what God wants done. Man, that's good. 
to think that there are people stumbling and wandering around in this life going, I wish I knew which way to go. I wish I knew what this life was about. And sadly, many Christians going, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Is it this? Is it that? Is it the other? But I'm praying for you today that you'd be filled with the knowledge of his will, that there'd be no room for confusion or anything else in you that there'd be no knowledge of any other person's will or pressure on you to do something other than what God has called and created you to do and be in Jesus' name. Can you agree with that? But listen, being filled with the knowledge of His will comes in having the wisdom of God. And then notice what else he said, spiritual understanding. Have you found out yet that there is a huge difference between natural understanding and spiritual understanding, especially when it comes to making decisions about the course of your life and the direction you will take. Because there are certain things that make sense naturally, but there are things that make sense spiritually. And you need to know the difference because the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man. That would be natural understanding. You look at the numbers, right? You add it all up and on paper, it looks good. Well, it's what daddy did and what's, it's what daddy's daddy's daddy did. And it's what I'm going to do. It's a way that seems right, but be very careful because there is a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. Well, if there's a path that leads to death, what must else there be? A path that leads to life and life more abundantly. So how do you get on that path? Well, it requires, number one, being filled with the knowledge of the will of God. Number two, being filled with the wisdom of God. And coupled with that is spiritual understanding. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he says, to him who has, more will be given. To him who has what? Understanding, revelation. Not natural understanding, spiritual understanding. That's like hearing the word of God and your spirit coming alive on the inside going, oh man, that's good. That's right. That's my answer. That's what I needed. That's what I came for. And your brain's going, what? What? I don't get it. What do you do when your head's going one way and your spirit's going the other? Well, you let your spirit lead and you say, head, shut up. You'll get it later. But to him who has this spiritual understanding, more will be given. You want more spiritual understanding? Then walk in what you've got. I've got just a few seconds here, but listen, I'll prove this to you. Verse 13, Jesus said, Therefore I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, and they do not understand. And then the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you'll hear and, and not understand, seeing you'll see and not perceive. The hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their uh, eyes, hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts. This is what we're getting into all this week right here. What it means to understand and value the word from a spiritual understanding where? Not in the head, in the heart. If it's not working in your life, go back to this right here. Are you living with spiritual understanding in the spirit or trying to make it make sense in the flesh? There's always going to be a tug of war, but I'm encouraging you today, yield to your spirit. When your spirit comes alive, roll with it, go with it and say, that's my answer. That's what I needed to hear. We're out of time, but don't go anywhere. I'll be back in just a moment. We hope you enjoyed today's teaching from Kenneth Copeland Ministries. And remember, Jesus is Lord.